This conference will now be recorded. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first op uh, operations subcommittee meeting of the new year. Um, I want to welcome everyone um, to this meeting. I also just want to acknowledge that we are in a very tumultuous state right now in our country. So I just want to acknowledge if folks are distracted. Um, we are having a very important conversation about our community. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that there's a lot going on today. So um, our goal for today is to discuss um, RTD transit service levels for 2021. Um, we will also move further into our discussion around potential recommendations related to the RTD fare structure and past programs. Um, there's been a lot of feedback uh, that I've received from not only members of this committee, but also members of the other committees. So uh, we wanna spend some time unpacking that together. Um, in terms of the agenda, I just want to check in with the committee members to see if there's any um, additional items that we may have missed or other matters that folks might want to address uh, during the course of our conversation. All right, hearing none, I'm going to go ahead and move us forward. Um, so the first item that we have on our agenda is a discussion about RTD transit service levels. And I'm going to turn it over to Jesse um, to give us an update on what might be happening there. So, Jesse, I want to check in with you to see if you have a presentation and if we need to make you a co-presenter for this. No, actually, I don't have a presentation. And um, I'm going to actually ask uh, our, our CEO, Deborah Johnson, uh, if she wanted to make an opening statement. Uh, about our current service levels before I go into any details. And really, uh, what I my participation will largely be to answer any questions that the committee has at this point in time. Because again, I'm kind of behind the eight ball. I have not been given uh, clear direction because we don't have a lot of information. But with that, I will uh, let uh, Deborah speak to that. So uh, thank you. Thank you very kindly, Jesse. And good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee, uh, subcommittee. Thank you very much for your comments in reference to what's going on currently. Um, I have been engaged in meetings and when I looked at my phone, I was deeply plagued by what I see happening. So I appreciate the acknowledgement of that. Uh, with that as a backdrop, I know I've been with some of you all earlier this morning on a Monday, so I may sound like a broken record, but wanted to preface uh, what Jesse's going to put forward by us being in a quandary of the unknown as well. So I just wanted to ensure that you all are cognizant of the fact while we may be talking about service levels as what we know them to be recognizing when we had discussions around this, um, it was prior to having an understanding of impending stimulus dollars. We're still awaiting to see what those amounts actually will be. Um, we are committed to working collaboratively and cooperatively to monitor varying service levels, recognizing that we still are in the midst of a pandemic and want to ensure that we are providing a safe operating system and minimizing the angst, especially as we look to retain, reclaim, and recruit customers uh, back to the RTD system. Um, with that as a backdrop, wanted to share more so as well that we want to be engaged and have a conversation, not make it appear as if it is a fait accompli. Um, my service planning team is very cognizant of that as we all talked about that and we recognize that we're me moving people to and fro and that you all have, you know, great ideas. So with that as a backdrop, I will ask Jesse to orient you all more or less to what he talked about on Monday to um, the governance committee relative to where we see ourselves going, but want to really impart upon you all that this is a fluid, agile situation, and we vow to be nimble as we move forward, recognizing that businesses could open up, that vaccinations are widespread, and recognizing when we do receive this anticipated stimulus money, we will be looking at that to ensure that we can um, reclaim uh, some of our workforce to ensure that we're delivering services specified in the legislation. So with that as a backdrop, Jesse, I will yield the floor to you, sir. Uh, to orient them as to what lies ahead, recognizing that that's very um, flexible and we can be adaptable. So thank you for your attention and the opportunity to speak. You are on mute, Jesse. And while you are unmuting, I just wanna welcome um, Jackie and Brett and Chris as well.
So to catch folks up really quickly, well, it looks like Jesse is um, experiencing some technical difficulties. Um, we are getting a service update on what uh, service levels look like uh, at the moment and then how the impact of the new CARES funding might impact um, uh, service delivery. So Jesse, I see that you're back on or at least unmuted. I believe I am and I apologize for that. Uh, my phone hates me and I don't know why it didn't do too much to it, but you know, it doesn't like me at this point in time. However, I do wanna just you know give you an idea of the level of service that we have right now. While we're in the COVID uh, posture, we are operating about 6,100 hours uh, per weekday, which is about 60% of what we normally would or pre-COVID numbers. So with that, we still have ridership that's approximately 40% of what it used to be, uh, seeing that we used to on a weekday average about 300,000 boardings a day. Uh, we're about 40% of that now. I will have to say that in recent months, our ridership has gone down between the month of November to December. Our system ridership has dipped a bit. And that's to be expected because going into the holiday season, we, we do see those types of dips. Um, right now, we don't, I don't see um, a lot of change in, in looking at the last reports coming from Downtown Denver Partnership. They are at 40% occupancy. So that's still, again, holding steady from, from this summer as well. Um, I, I don't see a real big return to the market that supported our regional services, those commuter-based services. So we're not seeing um, any more than the, the normal type of request for additional services or additional trips on our existing services. So I don't have a, a, a a clear view as to what we should be doing for um, the next uh, service change period, but we will always have the blueprint of our previous system um, as a way of returning uh, to our service, to the service levels once the demand is there. But right now, I have to say that uh, we're not seeing a, a huge uptick in, in, in demand on the, on the service at this point. Uh, once we do see those changes, uh, we, I, I would hope that we could make those changes in a way that we can convey the message to the public, have a conversation with the public about uh, the types of services that will take priority uh, in, in, in a return to service, and at the same time, uh, adjust to somewhat more permanent changes to the market. Uh, with that, I'd like to open to questions or uh, if uh, Mr. Bill, Bill Van Meter, or again, uh, Deborah Johnson, if you would like uh, to make additional comments, uh, I would like to open up at this point in time. Um, thank you, uh, Jesse, very much for that. The one thing I would like to share for everyone's edification as we talk about, you know, service levels and, and data reference the um, additional stimulus money. As I said before, we will be monitoring service to see where we could add supplemental service. And in relationship to having our frontline employees um, you know, return to work once we have a clear understanding of what that is, we will be taking a laser like, you know, view as relates to where that makes most sense. And quite naturally, as I said before, to Jesse's point that he raised, um, engaging with the public to ascertain where there might be a need. Um, so outside of that, I don't have anything to add unless other members of the RTD. You're good, Bill? Okay. All right. So with that, Dea, we'll turn it back over to you if you want to no, thank you. Elise, I see you have a question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for those comments. I was curious whether or not we had data, and I don't know if this is an RTD or Dr. Cog or someone else's uh, can answer this. In terms of sort of commuting patterns, how much of it is that commuters are choosing not to be on transit because perhaps of COVID concerns versus people are just not going back to work and they're working remotely. Do we have a sense of, because there are different problems to solve. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm just curious whether or not we have any, have done any deep dive into the numbers of exactly w what's happening with people moving in, in our region. You know, um, I'm sorry, this is Jesse again. The uh, information that Down Down Denver Partnership uh, is putting, puts together on a regular basis, uh, asking employers, uh, they do survey the employers, asking them how many people are returning to work, what other types of policies are they using. They also track the um, uh, the movement of people in the downtown area via uh, uh, watching the sidewalks, basically, and looking at the, the traffic patterns and looking at restaurant utilization and, and all those things. And it does do a 
pretty good job of giving you a sense of what the CBD uh, looks like. And that is our primary attractor for many of our commute services, not all, but many of our commute services like the 120X, 122X that are currently operating and also the FF1. Um, when we look at the, the, the ridership that they currently have, and that's something we are watching via automatic passenger counters along with that the information coming from downtown Denver Partnership, uh, it, it does show that there is a significant, there are a significant number of employers who are allowing work from home. Uh, and because of that, you know, I, I, that's kind of what I fear that may be more permanent than temporary. It may be something that goes along <laughs> that actually uh, lasts after COVID is, is, is over because people are finding that working from home is not an, as impractical as it was thought to be in the past. Um, I'm hoping that answers answers some of your question. Yeah, that's helpful. I mean, it, depending on what perspective we're looking at it from the fact that people are telecommuting isn't a bad thing from air quality and climate emissions and traffic. We just need anybody that is commuting to be using transit. And that's the, the change that we need to make. Um, so that's helpful. And I think the more the more we understand the nature of, of this, the, the better we'll be able to, to put forth solutions to try to address it. And to be absolutely honest, um, I, I have to look at it from an operations planning perspective. When I think about the peak period, if if the peak period doesn't come back in the same intensity it, as it had before, but instead we're allowed to invest what we used to have to invest as far as peak travel is concerned throughout the district, that may not be a bad thing in and of itself. So that that change, while while very different, might offer us a non-peak driven and a more uh, financially efficient way of providing service. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have another question. While members of the committee are, are kind of thinking up, um, about uh, questions they may have for for either Deborah and or Jesse, um, I am kind of curious. I, I I jumped in to the finance committee a little bit late, but um, in terms of workforce retention and hiring, I mean, I know RTD is currently going through the process of furloughing some staff. Um, and I, I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about what that might look like. Um, that is also a charge of this committee to, to explore workforce retention, hiring, and just overall general management in terms of operations. I don't know, Deborah, if you, Deborah and or Jesse, if either of you can, talk, can speak to, um, what is the plan for possibly bringing back furloughed staff and what's that intersection with the, the new um, federal stimulus package? Thank you very much, Daya. I'll address that question. Um, and I think it's a good one because of course, recognizing that all of us are aware about this impending money and recognizing that it states, you know, within the bill text um, that is for the impacts brought about by COVID and retaining employees and things of the like. As I was sharing uh, this morning with some of you, keeping in mind that we're, you know, in this place where we don't know how much money we're going to get, it is our intent to, you know, bring back employees. And in doing so, what we plan to do when working in conjunction with um, Michael Ford, who serves as our chief operations officer and members of his team, which include Jesse quite naturally and others, you know, from a more uh, holistic sense within RTD, what we are trying to ensure is that we have ample operators at the ready. So recognizing while our service levels may only be at 60%, um, we still have a need because there's going to be people impacted. We have people um, that are in, you know, these frontline positions that may be out on leave due to the fact of the pandemic. We still have service to deliver. Uh, folks could be out on workers' comp and other types of leaves as well. So we need to ensure that we have what we call an extra board, um, which is analogous to like having a substitute teacher. You need to have somebody on hold that you can, you know, that you can lean to when in fact somebody needs to take some, uh, uh, um, how am I trying to qualify this, some unexpected leave. And so not only do we need it for that purpose, but also to supplement our service on the busier routes. With us trying to adhere to social distancing and other protocols, we may use what we call, you know, trippers, meaning we're going to put out extra buses on various routes. So we need to have those operators readily available because 
if we have a plethora of people out there and we're trying to ensure social distancing by only having 15 people on a 40 foot bus, then we're going to have to deploy an additional bus to sort of, you know, do a sweep and follow up and be a follower of that original bus to ensure that we can move people to and fro. There also could be instances where we have higher um, travel demands during some time of the day. And so that's what we intend to do with these employees that have been impacted. And that could happen as soon as we have an understanding of the amount of money we're going to actually receive because we could start the process with bringing those individuals back. I anticipate that to be somewhere around, um, you know, February could be as early as mid-February, recognizing that, you know, the FTA uh, has to do our apportionment within 30 days. So if we were to receive information pertaining to that, we can start with that since they're reimbursable items. So I hope that addresses your question. I know it's not as definitive as folks would like, but I'm just operating with the, the information I have at this current time. Jesse or, oh, I'm sorry, Director Whitmore. Yeah, Madam Chair, just one minor point to add to the situation um you know we have furloughs and we have layoffs mm -hmm. and when you look at the faces of all the rtd employees or at least their initials on this call every one of them have been affected with with furloughs this year and proposed for next year so there's that wrinkle that we're dealing with as well and you know with that that furlough day comes a day with uh, off with no pay so um you know it reaches uh, all aspects of the organization so I just wanted to to add that in as there's a little bit of a of, of a differential between furlough and layoff and I've, if I misspoke on that Deborah please please correct me but I just want to make that point thank you very much well, thank you very much director Whitmore and that's a very important point because while we do have furloughs for our non-representative employees and also taking salary adjustments um, we do have workforce reductions ie layoffs and so when we talk about the frontline operator ranks, those are layoffs, but considering that we have reached an agreement with them and they're going to be receiving, you know, um, their pay as well as other benefits, they will still be in our system for at least two and a half months because we have to have them within our system in order to do to provide them with said benefits. So thank you very much, Director Whitmore. That's a very important point. Thank you. Um, I am going to pull a question in from um, from the attendees. Um, has there been any outreach to chambers of commerce or local agencies to learn what they are, or at least what they know about local commute patterns at this time? And Jesse, that might be a question for you. I'm also just to build on that, kind of curious if you all have connected with any of the um, local anchor institutions outside of downtown Denver um, to just hear what they may be experiencing. It looks like Jesse might be trying to unmute himself again. <laughs> okay, and you guys thought I was kidding about my phone hating me. <laughs> <laughs> actually, uh, yeah, uh, great question. And we actually don't have to solicit input uh, quite as much as we are hearing fr directly from our customers, uh, be it down to the person who's writing and also City of Aurora. Uh, we have different other other types of agencies who have made contact with us in the counties uh, telling us about their their commute patterns and asking for certain routes to be considered for reemployment or uh, re um, implementation so we, like I said we have our blueprint of our of our existing system or the pre-COVID system as a way of coming back. Uh, but we also have the memories of our, our former customers that kind of uh, remember the services that they had that you know they are writing in on a regular basis, calling in on a regular basis. And uh, we're, we're holding uh, to a point where we do have either the revenue to support and the warrants to provide those services that have currently been suspended. And if you don't, if if no one minds, I'm going to leave my microphone on. Uh, hopefully, I'm not providing too much background noise. If so, because <laughs> I don't want to struggle with this phone again. No, you're good. Thank you. Um, any other questions from members of the committee before we move on? 
Aquí. Dea, what, one of the things that Lo the city of Lone Tree is looking to do in the second quarter of, of next year, of this year, yay, it's this year, is uh, kind of a welcome back campaign. We've got about um, well over 10,000 employees that are within, you know, steps of the light rail station. And what, what we're going to be doing is kind of trying to welcome them back to, to uh, transit and to the city in general and to you know the shopping, dining experiences in our community. And I'm just wondering what um, RTD's plans are, if they've started considering some kind of a welcome back to the system as we see uh, the increase in vaccinations um, and, um, it, and, and the return we want to encourage those employees to be coming back into our community and we want to encourage them to come in using transit. Um, we'd love to partner with RTD on that. And I guess just curious if there are plans underway within the organization to have some kind of a, I do think it's a marketing campaign, so. Thank you very much. I will address that question and I appreciate that very much. Um, I have a meeting scheduled with our communications team whereby we're going to have a visioning session for three and a half hours as we talk about people moving people. So I'm letting the cat out of the bag and Paulette is probably going to kill me. But that's something that we have in the hopper as we talk about how do we entice people to come back to the system. And in addition to that, if I may, having met with Bill Van Meter and his team as we talk about reimagine RTD, what will that look like? You know, while there's established groups um they can attest i said we need to ensure that we have a customer group so we can ascertain what it is that they might need as we go forward to try to reshape um the whole transit experience because we want to ensure that we are reclaiming our customers and that there's great customer satisfaction and in turn they could become promoters of the system so I'm gonna hold you to that. We will partner and let's create something that everybody else will marvel and then people will hate us and they'll be chomping at the bit about, oh my God, it's not fair. So that's what I'm striving for. So thank you, Jackie. So I am gonna, ha I have one more question that will move us into the next portion of the of the agenda. Um, I, I am just kind of curious, you know, the, the other chart of this committee or at least the other part of our agenda is really focused on um, simplifying the fair structure and really looking at it from an equity perspective. Um, as you, as RTD thinks about um, what it might take to get folks back onto transit in addition to a marketing campaign, has there been any conversation about what it might look like to kind of rethink the fair structure in a way that gets people back, um, either by reducing the fair or even temporarily um, implementing like quick pilot projects? So I appreciate that question and I've had various conversations. I'm going to be very transparent with all of you. When I first came here, I said, and Director Whitmore's nodding, I'm like, this fair structure, I don't understand. And as the person leading this organization, I was having problems. I had a friend slash colleague that was asking questions about it and I couldn't explain it. It's like this insurance model and I'm not trying to throw sand in anyone's eyes. I'm just speaking in a forward manner coming into this area and having to buy a transit pass myself. So with that as a backdrop, I think it needs to be easy. And when I say it needs to be easy, I do think it's too expensive. And these are my thoughts and I've shared with various members of the board. Um, when we talk about a growth ridership action plan, I firmly believe there's intersectionality. So we have to discuss what it is that we're trying to solve. And if we're looking at ridership, one of the core aspects of that would be to have you know, fares. Um, I believe we have to look at varying market segments. There's been a myriad of different reasons as to why people have left the system, but I'm of the school of thought it should be whatever's in your wallet. And having done that in other parts of the country, it makes most sense. We can look at different customer rewards programs. We could look at gamification. We can look at, you know, guaranteeing the lowest fare. And what I mean for that, when we talk about equity issues, a lot of people can't afford transit fare. I think about, you know, the single mother that may have kids, you know, in middle school and high school. It's hard to pay three fares, right? But if in fact you have an accumulator where you guarantee, so what I mean is say day one, you know, you have to pay $3 a day for a local fare. And then the next day, another $3. You don't, most people don't have that money up front, 
But by the time you reach a threshold, if you're using, you know, a fair media component and you reach that threshold of, you know, some kind of discounted pass, you're guaranteed that rate. So those are the different type of ideas that I think we should be looking at. There's partnerships and we're talking about supporting local business. You know, if you show your fair media from RTD with a local business, we're trying to be interwoven in the fabric of the community. Perhaps there's a discount there, right? And so even a discount that we can provide, not putting the onus on a third party, but hey, if you ride our system, you know, I'm just picking some arbitrary number 10 times a month, maybe the next month you get a free pass. And those are the types of things that we're looking at holistically. So when we ask the question, um, as members of my team know, I believe we should do a full-fledged fair equity analysis as relates to, you know, Title VI. There are some programs that we could pilot under the guidance that we have from the FTA and Title VI for a six-month period of time. But all of these things, I think, need to be taken into earnest, and we can't have a cookie-cutter approach. It's very important that we look at all the customer segments and then make decisions accordingly. Thank you so much for that. Um, so thank you uh, both to Deborah and to Jesse for joining us. Um, certainly, please feel free to jump in as we continue the conversation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and shift us, shift us to the second portion of our agenda, which is really focused on the fair structures. So um, I want to continue the discussion that we had at our uh, previous meeting around RT fair and pass programs. And there's been a lot of uh, conversation that's been happening both um, in this meeting, but also um, just through email as we were working on the uh, recommendation that most members on this uh, committee have now had a chance to review. So what I'd like to do is actually spend a little bit of time um, kind of grounding us in what are overall charges uh, in terms of this committee and why we're focusing on fares first and foremost. Um, so as you all probably remember, initially the the committee laid out six uh, priority areas for us, one of which was equity and service provided to the district, analyzing it through geography, social equity, fair structure, and the needs of transit-dependent transit populations. Um, there's been some conversation around aligning all of the discount fares, so senior, youth, persons with disability, low income, um, some of this more proactive outreach and ensuring that the community is engaged um, at the front end um, rather than coming to, to them for feedback. Um, simplifying and creating a, a fair structure that, um, to Deborah's earlier point, is easy to understand, easy to explain. Um, can it be explained to a, I always think of like, how can it be explained to a five-year-old and a five-year-old understand it, um, but also easy for the operator. So looking at it from a workforce lens as well and minimize the impact um, to equity populations. Um, so I, I wanted to open it up for a little bit of a discussion from the committee. I know at least you had shared some feedback that I know the team in Boulder had been working on and I, I just wanna open it up and see if you'd like to at least share a little bit about um, your thoughts with this committee so we can all be out on the same page. Um, thanks, do you mind if I ask Alex Heidwright from Boulder County staff who's also on this call maybe to do that since um, he was the brains behind a lot of those. Alex, would you feel comfortable um, outlining some of the recommendations? I know I'm putting you on the spot. Of course, you may have put me on the spot, so hey. I'm sorry. <laughs> For the uh, fares and pass programs? Yes. yes. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, I, um, I think some of the ideas were to simplify um, the eco pass and take a look at the um, insurance model that's currently used on the business side um, and then also revamping how the utilization based pricing is done um, for the neighborhood eco passes um, I think in particular one thing that we've heard um, from several members of this committee and then also from our own business community is that right now if EcoPass isn't a good model for your business there's not really a ton of good alternatives and I think uh, Mayor Malay has brought up the example of um, one of the companies uh, in her jurisdiction where they don't have enough employees that it makes sense to pursue EcoPass for every employee, but they'd still like to participate and there's not a terribly good offering right now. And so finding finding a business pass option that works um, for businesses that only have a, a relatively small percentage of their employees that want to participate um, would be a big option. Um, I think we've we've suggested um, a lot of different examples for uh, modifications to the live program 
um, including how people um, could receive their live uh, ID cards, um, how they'd be able to pay the fare, um, and then additional options for municipalities or governments to be able to subsidize fares um, either through the through my ride or push out um, codes to the mobile platform um, so you know that that's a, a few of the ideas that I could I could go on or I think that's some good context um, Alex thank you for for jumping in and thank you for allowing me to put you on the spot um, I wanted to share that uh, at least as a a, a framing and a starting point to what is it exactly that we're really trying to solve as a committee because uh, again part of our charge has really been focused on um, not necessarily uh, shiny new objects but what is it that we're really trying to get at what's that core issue and um, I think a couple of things that I just want to lift up are current fares are, are generally too high um, and it's high in comparison to other uh, transit agencies and, and we've received a lot of research and support um, from folks on that uh, a point that Deborah lifted up earlier is that the current fare structure can be very confusing and difficult to navigate um, and and especially for folks that might not necessarily be English speaking so when we think about equity populations it's just very difficult um, and then as Jesse mentioned or not Jesse I apologize um, as Alex mentioned access to eco pass and other pass structures um, is, is really voluntary you know it's voluntary so how do we how do we streamline this and make this a little bit um, more user-friendly system to use. So in terms of recommendations, I, I wanted to lift up a couple of things. I know we talked about e NicoPath simplification, EcoPath simplification. Um, Jackie uh, Mayermillet has made a, a, you know, a point of including anchor institutions and their role in fair structures. Um, so I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, and then in terms of fares, you know, the live ID simplification, um, there's been a conversation around fair capping um, that I'd also like to bring into this group as areas for us to focus in on. Um, and then one other area that we may want to explore is what is the lowest amount that we could potentially lower the fare to in order to get folks back onto transportation? Um, how do we get folks um, back on buses, if, if at all possible? Um, at least I see that you unmuted yourself. Well, I was just... If you have anything you to that end, one of the questions that has come up is whether or not um, RTD feels like the statutory limitation that exists now prevents them from experimenting or piloting um, with these lower fares um, until and unless we get legislation that gets rid of that cap. And I'm just curious, it would be helpful to know if we're operating under that constraint in your eyes or if we actually have for example, if we were to make recommendations for CARES Act funding to, you know, to do some of this. And I don't know, if I'm putting you on the spot, Deborah. I don't know if you know the answer to that question, but I think that would be helpful for us to know. No, 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 I appreciate that, Elise. And if anything, I'm less worried about statutory limitations. I'm more so worried about the federal aspect in relationship to what it is that we can do. Um, and I say that in the sense that, like, you know, doing six-month pilots, of course, you know, just as most of you, I am very concerned with equity across the board and recognizing that some of our most disenfranchised populations tend to carry the burden of paying for a system for others that are more affluent to utilize it. And so with that as a backdrop, I am open to doing various things and want to be as creative as possible um, because with me coming in with a different perspective and looking through a different lens, I feel comfortable in saying this in this group, let's try various things and the sky is the limit. Let's not hamstring ourselves to what it was, but let's see what it could be going forward. And having these dynamic programs, I think it's, it's imperative that we do do them from an equity-based perspective, but also looking at the population so we can discern what might be advantageous for a certain de demographic. So those are my initial thoughts with me being put on the spot, and I say that in jest, but I, I am more than happy to have um, a more in-depth conversation about that as well, once I can wrap my mind around it and perhaps we could have conversations. So I, I'm willing to do that. Thank you. Thanks, that's helpful. Yeah, I think that would be great. Um, 
I think one other question that that has been lifted up um, in terms of fares is understanding the cost of fare collection. And again, not to put the RTD team on the spot, but if if anyone may be able to give us some insight into what um, even rough back of the napkin estimates um, are in terms of what what it costs to to really collect trans, collect fare revenue, that would be helpful. Let's see, I don't know if we have anybody here that could speak to that because we have different platforms when we talk about probing a vehicle, collecting, you know, the, the actual dollars versus the TDMs versus our mobile platform. And if there's anybody on this call um, from RTD that could speak specifically to that, please feel free to do so. And if not, then we can ensure that if the next cup uh, if I could get the words out, subcommittee meeting, we can address that and we'll have the right person here. So any takers from RTD? I'm going to go ahead and say not it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm thinking it's more the finance ranks as it relates to Doug and his, his team. Okay. Yeah. So yes, why don't we tickle that and we'll ensure that we, you know, can get back to that question because I don't want to leave that dangling because that's very important. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And I think um, just something for the Dr. Cog team, I think this may also just be something that we may want to pull in the consultant um, to help help us work on. Um, I, I think that might be a good use of time, not only for this committee, but also certainly for the finance committee um, to get that assessment. Daya, we had also um, talked a little bit about fare evasion and a possible from what we've heard from other transit agencies, different strategies for dealing with that that might be less costly and impactful to individuals and the system, such as helping, our understanding being that it's a small number of frequent flyers that actually might be eligible for some of the past programs and we could eliminate um, some of the uh, enforcement costs by addressing that issue in other ways. And it, that's an issue that we might want to look into as well. It's mm -hmm. a great idea. Uh, Brett, I see your hand up. Yeah, I, I just want to second what you said on that day. I, I think we need to, it's always useful to look at endpoints. And one of those endpoints is what if transit was free, period. Mm -hmm. What are all of the costs associated with transit and collecting fares and promoting fares and all the other things that go into that. Uh, what is the real cost of that? How much of, of the system do we operate, can we operate just from the sales tax revenues that were given? This goes to the price of, of transit in Denver too. It, it does seem like it is anomalously high compared to the rest of the country, but it's useful to look at the endpoint. I mean, what if it, everything were free? What could we eliminate in terms of functionality or functions that we could put into other areas to, to really see what that value is? There was one other thing that we were, uh, Dea, we were looking at and we, we just started discussing sort of out of the box ideas. What if there was a rush hour fare? And what if there wasn't a rush hour fare outside that time when, when our trains and our buses are often carrying a whole lot of empty seats instead of people. Is there a way that we could, that we, you have to build a transit system for maximum demand, for rush hour demand, but is there a way we could exploit the availability of all those empty seats? Uh, and one of those possibilities is, what if that were free? Mm -hmm. If I could just That's jump in. That's such a fun idea, Deborah anything. has, yeah, Deborah, have people done that? I've, that is a, yes, that's why I'm uh, nodding my head. I actually have a conversation with Director Geisinger and other members as we talk about that because, if anything, it, it's what we learn supply and demand, right? So, recognizing that, um, you know, I worked at the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority in Washington, D.C., and we did just that, right? Because here we had a system bleeding at the seams during the peak. And we were trying to entice people to use the system in off-peak. So it's commonplace to have off-peak fares. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's cheaper and you, you, you want to get, you know, away from the crux of what we knew as the rush hour and get them on the shoulders. So there could be a substantial um, price reduction as relates to all of that. So 
It does work in some instances, but I, I, I caution you in the sense I support this, so don't get me wrong, but I got to play devil's advocate. You know, we could have this overwhelming support where we don't have enough space. That'd be a nice problem to have. We're far from having it, but yes. So I, I was just sitting here like smiling, thinking, yes, you know, because there's a lot of different opportunities. And, you know, what you mentioned, Rhett, free, I will also say there's no such thing as free. We get it, but to the end user, it may appear to be free. And these are things that we can explore, like partnerships, getting people to where they need to go, leveraging, you know, what we're getting in subsidies and, and things of the like. I'll give this one example. Um, <clears throat> having been down in Southern California when the NFL were doing a myriad of things and they moved the San Diego Chargers to LA. Well, where that stadium was located, it's between Long Beach and LA. So all of a sudden, you know, get a call from AEG and they want us to provide the system, to provide the service. We're like, we don't have any money for that. So for all intents and purposes to the average football fan, it appeared to be free. And mm -hmm. the point of the matter is they pay for it because when you think about those football tickets, you could put a dollar surcharge on each ticket and it looks free to the average bear because you're already paying all those others. So there's a lot of creativity we can do when we talk about free. We just got to be creative with that. So thank you for broaching it. There's one other observation, if I can, if I can make it, about the transfer of cost. If you can put enough people in transit when we have empty seats in a situation mm -hmm. like that, you're taking a lot of people off the highway. And that has a huge value. I mean, the, the studies that, that uh, UT Austin's done on the actual cost of congestion, is it's real. And it mm -hmm. has a huge impact on a lot of people's lives. Can I just, you know, I I'm, just I'm, want to jump I'm, in. Oh, I totally agree, Rut. And not only is it the cost of congestion, but I, if you've all been following the discussion about uh, the climate roadmap and whether yep. or not yep. we have enough in place to actually meet the targets, one of the weak, soft pieces is transportation. And that's mm -hmm. because, you know, getting people to make, indiv you know, individual decisions about how they live their lives. Um, if we can figure out, and this is bigger than the, the committee, but it's all about partnership and really um, figuring out the, the sort of global context we operate in, there are other entities that should be paying into this system to get people to ride transit. And if we had models that show, gee, free transit would reduce emissions a certain level, you know, there that's a cost that perhaps we could ask the other parts of the system to pay into and to help pay for. Um, mm -hmm. So it is worth understanding how far, what could we do to the transit system that, to increase ridership and then we can have a conversation about what what can RTD afford and what where would we have to go outside of RTD to get those costs covered. But I think it's a useful conversation to have. Yep. Chris, uh, yeah, I was really struck um, by Jesse's comment earlier about the peak and um, uh, and then and then thinking about this thing with the edges rut, but then also thinking about the. That, that what I think is very accelerated and actually really real long-term change to the way people go to work it, it, amongst white collar workers. I think that thing is real and permanent. I, I may find out that I'm wrong, but as someone who's downtown all the time, boy, there's nobody here. And there's an insurance building near my house over Lowry that I haven't seen more than 10 cars in that thing in, in nine months. And so as they come back and that flexibility is allowed, um, the ability to start to almost be a part of the change of behavior um, to say, hey, we're here for you when it's off this peak um, is, is really interesting. Is we're, we're sort of both causing and riding alongside of it by really encouraging ridership at different parts and, and as people start to consider different schedules for their for their team members in their offices. So um, it all feels very intriguing for the folks from the staff who you know obviously have to do these kinds of things, but it feels just like a very strange and as a real outsider, but it feels like a real strange moment uh, of opportunity, I think is what I would say. A very unanticipated kind of opportunity. Um, I mean, if the, if the peak could become less than the peak, <laughs> can you imagine? I mean, yeah. that, that's just the, you know, I, 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 you, you, church on Easter Sunday, everybody knows it. It'd be so nice if that church could be, we wouldn't have to spend all that money. We could spend it on other things. So um, right. work at home until it, nine o'clock and then take a free ride into town to have your I meeting and do the personal contact you need. Make the you day know, for folks who are, 
sharing part of it at home and part of it at the office. Uh, companies office. who can kind of pa companies who can pass that on to their employees, uh, particularly those who are transit dependent, they, they will find that appealing. Uh, and so, you know, there is, there is, you know, no different than our EcoPass customer. I mean, that, there's a real, there's really some, there's a, there's, a, there's a there there in my mind again. I don't know what I'm talking about. I want I to be gonna, clear. If, about. if I can kind of pull this back a little bit, um, and this is digging into my own memory of my my first days with Mile High Connects. I seem to remember. That at one point in RTD history, there was a peak, non peak pricing. And so I am very much of the philosophy if it didn't work then, how can we make it work now? Because maybe the circumstances just weren't such that it, it was worth it. But how do we learn from that to maybe implement it in a new way? And Bill, I see your hand raised. So I'm wondering if you may be able to share maybe what some of the, the challenges were um, so we can kind of think through what our mod modified version modern version is happy to yeah so through the 80s and 90s and i believe even before rtd did have a peak and an off peak fare we conducted a fair study in 2000 and 2001 and one of the key recommendations from that supported by the board and um, everyone at that time was to do away with that differential the um, reasoning was a fewfold. Uh, as best I recall, one of the key factors was doing away with fair disputes and making life easier on the RTD operators. So if the peak fare ends at 9.30 a.m. and I'm trying to get on at 9.29 and I get into an argument with an operator, it slows down operations. It's 9.30, now my watch, it's 9.31. Um, and there was a lot of stress and feedback from our own operators um, regarding having a single fare all the time, making life easier, which goes to a second piece of the puzzle, which was if the goal is to make our system easier and more legible for the users, the belief at the time, and probably still defensible now, is that having the same fare all the time is the same fare. You don't have to think, oh, I need 250 at the peak and 150 at the off peak, and um, how do I handle that? And there's more potential confusion. So those were the factors, the kind of key factors that I recall influencing. There was discussion and concerns about um, how that might shift our demand on the edges of the peak as was discussed here. We saw some of that, but not a lot, not enough that it, significantly impacted our our resources and how we had to disperse services um and jesse has his hand up so i'll shut up for the time being jesse. no i i just wanted to add in uh, all the complexities that bill expressed were made double by transferring so mm -hmm. the validity of your transfer became an argument point as well so it was held it was heard loud and clear that they wanted, and this is the public involved as well, they wanted a, a simplified fare system. Okay. So I think, so what I'm hearing um, really quick is that it's not that we should do away with that, but I, I just want to lift up a couple of things that are different maybe from where we were when RTD did have that versus where we are today. And one is certainly technology that might be able to mitigate some of those those pain points. It's not going to uh, mitigate all of the, the human factor and, and things like that, but I think we have some things that I think should not prevent us from at least re-exploring that. The other thing that I heard in the transfer is that my understanding was that through the past program working group, it eliminated that like the the transfer. I cannot I cannot remember what it is off the top of my mind, but it eliminated that. So I'm almost hearing like if we are able to do peak non-peak and kind of do it in this new modified way, like for example, maybe removing uh, fair zones and possibly um, even, um, sorry, I just had this on my notes, uh, maintaining the, the no transfers, that that might mitigate some of the, the initial operational barriers and also serve to make it a little bit easier. At least something for us to, again, just kind of play with as part of this group that we, you know, in terms of fairs, we may want to explore. Um, Elise, I saw your hand was raised. I want to... 
I was you just, know. the technology point, I mean, we're getting quickly to the point where nobody's going to be putting nickels, you know, into a, you know, a device in, in the front of the bus. It's all going to happen on phones and we'll have to address an equity element associated with that. But, but that should do away with a lot of this. And I, so I do think that that's a solvable issue. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that I just want to lift up in terms of, because I, I want to acknowledge we're up, we're getting close to time, um, is certainly around user experience, and we've touched on that a little bit. But um, it'd be uh, for for this group to really explore some of these recommendations a little further. It'd be nice to hear um, uh, whether all door boarding. I know this was part of the the COVID nineteen um, structure and Jesse, I don't know if you may be able to answer this, but what what would prevent or what might be preventing RTD from allowing all door boarding with some sort of on board um, validation of fares? Is there something that exists or prevents that at the moment? One of the things, it is a challenge. There are some safety challenges that are um, brought up when you are boarding people from a rear door on a 40 foot transit. Uh, it's not to say that those can't be uh, addressed as well, but that was one of our primary concerns is can the operator see pulling away from a stop someone boarding or trying to deboard from uh, from the bus in a way that to make our operation safe. So that was probably the biggest thing that I can recall that stood in the in the way of that. Um, we have conducted outdoor boarding inside stations uh, for as long as I can remember. Uh, so if you were to board inside like Denver Union Station, we do allow it. And uh, I, I can't imagine that, like you said, technology couldn't address at some point in time the ability to, to board you know, many of our stops. But there are some challenges out in um, the, the district as far as uh, infrastructure that make it tougher to, to use the rear door. If I can just add on to that, having come from systems that have done all door boarding, and I was part of the team in San Francisco when we enacted that, some of the differences there is that we had transit fare inspectors that were at the back of the doors to help with the facilitation. And the whole notion was to create the throughput as a bus is, you know, birthed at a, a stop. Um, and so in doing so, the issues that Jesse brought up, uh, there are concerns that somebody could get caught under a real a rear wheel and be degloved, and that's a horrible situation, having seen that in, live and in person. Um, but there are modifications. There's indicators. There are a lot of different technological advancements uh, that we could utilize and place on a bus that would give an indication to the operator when somebody got too close to, like, the wheel well and things along those lines. I think it would be beneficial as we go forward and can look at that um, so I just wanted to offer that up that, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's, it's not a challenge, but we need to invest in some technology to ensure we're minimizing our risk as a transit agency, uh, especially as we uh, more or less acclimate people to that new way of boarding. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dan, yeah, part of the safety, part of the experience also is safety and how safe the riders feel in the system and on the system. And one of the comments that I have heard, and I think it's more COVID related, but there is a, and I don't know if it's an increase or not, but the feedback that I am hearing is that it feels like there's an increase in transient population on the system. And it may just be there aren't as many other folks on the system as well. But there is a safety concern of, from, from riders about how safe they feel and having a uh, having uh, been a, a user of the subway system in New York and BART out in the Bay Area, I certainly know that sometimes I felt unsafe depending on the time of day and who else was on the train with me. And um, I don't know, I don't know how that can be addressed, but as part of the experience, I think safety, uh, the safety of the rider, uh, particularly I'm talking more about light rail now, that's been mm -hmm. more my experience and my community's experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jackie. So I want to acknowledge we have about four minutes left and in terms of at least what I'm hearing as potential recommendations or at least kind of firming up the the passes and the fares, at least potentially recommendations. Um, I'm hearing on the fares this idea of peak, non-peak and potentially even for the pass programs, how do we do a peak, non-peak uh, pass program structure, simplifying um, the, the process overall. Um, 
trying to get the fare as low as possible, regu rec recognizing the, the federal regulations and, and um, things that are outside of RTD's control, but how do we ultimately make sure that this fare is as um, simple as possible for folks to understand regardless of zone, so eliminating, potentially eliminating zones um, and uh, maintaining that this uh, no, no charge for transfers. That's what I'm hearing, at least on the fare side. On the passes side, I also heard some similar recommendations or at least some, some similar structure around potentially peak, non-peak, non um, but I, I wanna check in with this group to make sure I heard that right. Um, I certainly heard the NICO EcoPass simplification, making sure that it's an, uh, an offering that is enticing for a business, uh, regardless of size to, to take advantage of. Um, we still have a little bit more work to do, I think on that, on the pass piece. Um, not necessarily the fares. And then the other um, the other component that's still related to this is around user door or user experience and just getting folks uh, comfortable with getting onto the transit system. So exploring this maybe a little bit more around all door boarding, recognizing some of the safety challenges, but exploring what that might look like, uh, assessing fare evasion um, compared to other communities and what what might be some other strategies that we want to explore. Um, to eliminate that cost and again, realize some, some form of cost savings for RTD. Um, I wanna check in with the group just to make sure that I'm hearing, I'm hearing those firm up. Yeah, if your... I can just make a qualifying statement. When I mentioned the federal government, FTA, they don't mandate what we can charge for a fare. I just wanted to be clear, if we did a pilot, it was only for six months and then we have to ensure that it's not causing a you know, disproportionate impact or um, a, a burden, um, a disparate burden, a disparate impact and a disproportionate burden on, you know, varying communities. So that's all I wanted to qualify. Thanks. Great. No, thank you for that. I, I, I think maybe that that will be the strategy for us to explore is how do we start to formulate a recommendation that could potentially be piloted under these two, uh, what would it look like to pilot um, fares and passes? Chris, I want to just check in with you. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to very simply say, I keep thinking of it, it's easier, cheaper, mm -hmm. and strategic. And mm -hmm. I think those are the, like, maybe a bit of the organizer principle as it relates to fares. Um, Daya, I was going to ask you, because we have not today talked about um, some of the con concepts around, uh, you know, light jumping and lane sharing and that kind of stuff uh, as it relates to downtown, et cetera. Are we going to try to talk about that next time we get together? Okay, great. Yeah, I'd like to talk about yeah. that um, under the like actual service operations. I want to firm up at least some kind of recommendation and then we'll look at all all of these components together. So I want to spend the next great. meeting really looking at that um, if possible. Cool. That'd be awesome. Yes, Jesse. Um, when he, I'm, I'm sorry, Chris, when you mentioned yeah. like jumping, you queue jumping or ac actual preemption? No. Uh, no, being at the red, you know, you get the red light to belong to the bus first. Um, yeah, so they can, yeah, I, I don't know what the term to art is. Uh, but yeah, Jesse, yeah, we're very interested in beating up on our friends at CDOT to make them help accommodate and then getting great assistance from our friends at all the very different, different municipalities that are represented here and elsewhere throughout the regional council of governments. Maybe uh, picking it up with a very large group, though. So, yeah. <laughs> Right. So I see that that we're at time and, and again, as I mentioned at our last meeting, the goal was to at least spend one meeting really kind of honing in while not getting to perfect on um, a recommendation in terms of fares and past structures. We still have a little bit more work to do, but I think we're, we're at a point where we can maybe start to look at other components of our of the operations work of our, of our overall work group because we have a lot to cover. Um, so I want to check in with you, Matthew, to see, I know we're at time. Is there anything else that you need to report out to this group um, before we wrap up? No, great conversation today. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Thank rest you, of your Dana. day. Nice job.